Thank you everyone for standing by. And welcome to our webinar entitled The Value of Lake Erie Beaches. This is a webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio's Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision-making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory. And joining me today is Dr. Brent Sanjan from Ohio State University. Dr. Sanjan is a professor of environmental and resource economics in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental and Development Economics at Ohio State. He conducts research on the economics of land use change, the design of incentive mechanisms for water and carbon trading, carbon sequestration, and value of environmental resources. Uh, Dr. Sanjan developed a global forest and land use model that has been widely used to assess the implications of climate change on, ec on ecosystems and markets and to assess the cost of carbon sequestration in forests. Dr. Sanjan has written or co-written over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, sections of the 2001 and 2007 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, and he co-authored the forestry chapter of the most recent U.S. National Climate Assessment Report. We're delighted to have Dr. Sanjan here today to talk to, with us about his Lake Erie beach value research. But before we do, uh, just a few things about the webinar logistically. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I will conduct a question and answer session. We have a great group of participants representing agencies, academia, and nonprofits on this call, including a fifth grade class from North Olmsted. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during Dr. Sanjan's talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to him at the end of his presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is be re being recorded for to be posted on our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey it will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sanjan, who will be talking about the value of Lake Erie beaches. Dr. Sanjan. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jill. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. And thanks to uh, you and Christina for the invitation, uh, as well as for you guys running such a professional webinar. Let's hope I don't mess it up by sharing something incorrectly or <laughs> saying something dumb. Sorry. I think you will be fine. <laughs> okay. I right, saw so my screen should be sharing now. Are you guys seeing that there? You are good. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so it's great to be with everybody today uh, and talk about this exciting research. It actually began quite a long time ago uh, and worked out great. We got our, our field work done right before the pandemic and uh, have gotten a lot done since as well. And so it's exciting to be here and to be able to talk to you about this. Um, this is work that was done by four of us and a bunch of other people as well, who I'll talk about later. Uh, but uh, Greg Boudreau was a master's student at Michigan State University working with Frank Lupe, who's a professor up there in their Ag Econ department. Uh, Alan Shu is a former graduate student in our, our department here at Ohio State. And so the four of us work together on this. I'm presenting it, but really the bulk of the work was done by Greg, uh, who you know, really did uh, yeoman's work in putting this analysis together. Uh, Alan and I, uh, to some extent, did Yeoman's work in terms of getting some of the data collected, uh, but really it was a team effort. It was a fun team to be on. So thanks to Sea uh, Grant for funding uh, the bulk of this, as well as NSF for funding some, and, and NOAA obviously is a, a supporter of Sea Grant. What did we set out to do? Well, the question we wanted to ask is how many people visit Lake Erie beaches? You know, as important as these beaches are to many of us, uh, it, there's not really a lot known about who visits them and how much time people spend on them. So we wanted to just figure that out. So that was one of the goals. Uh, we wanted to determine the value of these trips, both to the individuals taking them as well as their value to the local economy. And then we wanted to look at this important question of how they, how those visitors uh, respond to beach warnings and closing closings. These have been a natural feature on Lake Erie for a long, long time. And obviously with uh, harmful algal blooms the last decade or two, uh, they become really even more important, especially to people in the Western basin. So we wanted to talk and learn a little bit about those. And then finally, we wanted to value the impacts of those. So those are the questions we're asking. Uh, what do we do? How do we do it, I should say? Um, well, it turns out that 
you know, there, there's a few beaches that do keep track of visitors, but most beaches don't. And we don't have a lot of information on how many people go there. So how do we uh, figure a way to actually go out and determine the number of visitors and find something about their values? Well, we had to do an intercept survey. So we had to go out to 28 beaches along the shoreline. Uh, we focused on Ohio and Michigan up through uh, those beaches up on Lake St. Clair as well. So, and, and what we did is just designed a sampling procedure, a stratified random sampling procedure where we would basically stratify days in which we would uh, go to the beaches and then randomize the times that the individuals who are visiting the beaches would actually show up there. So it's a random stratified sample. And what those individuals did when they showed up at the beach, these are our enumerators, they showed up and they would count the number of people they saw on the beach, and then they would uh, randomly intercept a certain proportion of those individuals. It might be everyone if there's only like five people on the beach, but if it's a beach with 300 or 400 people, then they would, you know, basically randomly sample X number up till about a half hour of sampling because they had to make it to the next beach after that. So, so that's basically what we did. And we're able to derive an enormous amount of information from that. Uh, as well, we asked the individuals when we intercepted them uh, a few questions, very simple as about a two minute survey, but we also asked them if they participate in an online follow-up survey. Many of them said they would, so we also have results from this follow-up online survey that I'll present here in a second. So that's what we did. Let's dive right into the results. I think that's what most people are interested in. Uh, what we found, and I'll focus on the, so we did the survey over two years, a 2018 survey and a 2019 survey. So I'll focus first on the 2019 survey and we'll introduce the 2018 results in, uh, a bit as well. But the 2019 survey was more complete. It had all the beaches in it. Um, what we found is that we estimate that in those 28 beaches, including both the Michigan beaches, Lake St. Clair, uh, as well as all the way to the uh, eastern uh, border with Ohio and Pennsylvania, 1.5 million visitors uh, visited the beaches, our estimate for that year, or visited those 28 beaches. The value, that is the value those individuals got out of those visits, we estimate it being 25.4 million per year or $17 per trip. Now we also estimated the expenditures. So that was part of our survey was figuring out how much the individuals spent when they went on trips in different kinds of categories, uh, such as you know, gasoline, uh, lodging, groceries, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. The direct expenditures we found were 106 million per year uh, for all of those beaches. And 65% of those, the individuals declared were within 10 miles of the beach. When we add together that with some economic analysis that's, that tries to determine how much of an impact uh, when we include the indirect expenditures, that is the, the money that was spent in the groceries that then induced additional um, sort of expenditures by the groceries, et cetera, the economic contribution was uh, 147 or $148 million. So significant contribution. The figure on the right shows the big beaches where the most visitation was Edgewater in Cleveland, obviously, Bell Island or Bell Isle in uh, Detroit, essentially Sterling State Park in Michigan and East Harbor, sort of the two state parks in Ohio and a state park in Michigan, as well as one sort of closer to large urban areas. Uh, the other, other beaches, I don't name them over there, but you can kind of see from uh, Lake St. Clair to Eastern Ohio, the, the amount of value in each of the different beaches. And it's really correlated with the, the visitation, although there, is, there are some differences in the per trip values for each of those as well. So when we take those numbers and start to try to maybe put them into something useful, I was able to do this for uh, six of our beaches. It's a little bit time consuming and cumbersome to figure out because I'm not a great GIS person. You know, what is the frontage, that is the amount of shoreline on each beach in, in feet? I shouldn't say feet squared, that's just for linear foot. Uh, and then the economic value for the acres of actual beach. That's not for the whole park, it's just for the acres of the beach. Now, our survey focused only on people who were on the beach. So we, you know, some of these parks, like, uh, for example, Edge, uh, East Harbor or Edgewater in Cleveland, you know, they have extra other places that people can do recreation and there's far more recreation than we counted happening at those state parks, but we focused only on the visitors on the beaches. Um, so these numbers are specific to the beaches. So the economic value for the beach area, that is the value individuals got out of it, was $14,000 basically in Port Clinton Beach, $306,000 in East Harbor, $322,000 in Edgewater. You know, you can see some of the other ones there. So these are significant values. You can compare this to, you know, what you would be willing to pay for an acre to build a house on in your community and think about whether these numbers, you know, relate to that. I can say for my community uh, here in Columbus that these numbers are, at least the ones in the hundreds of thousands are far bigger than the per acre value of buying a bare piece of land to put a new house on it uh, in most places here. So this is really valuable recreational land and people are putting significant value on it. That's what these numbers tell us. The third column is the economic contribution. So that estimates the value 
that goes to the local economy as a result of having this public space that people can go on and, and recreate on. So this is the money people are spending in their community or in the community around these beaches. Uh, and it's significant, $95,000 per acre in Port Clinton, significant amount of money up to you know, $1.7 or $1.8 million at East Harbor State Park, uh, Edgewater, $1.8 million as well, and Nickel Plate, a beautiful little beach up there at $1.4 million. So there's, there's significant value, uh, not just for the individuals who are doing the recreation, but also for the money they're spending and the impact and contribution of that to the local economy. So these are significant contributions, um, you know, that they, they're probably not the same size as, say, a, a factory, an automobile factory or something like that on a per acre basis, but they're significant for most other economic activities uh, in the state of Ohio. So this is a big number. Uh, one of the things we're able to do with this data when we start to think about water quality effects is we recognize that 2019, many of you can remember back to that, it was kind of a high water year. And many, some of our beaches, especially East Harbor, that's one to sort of think about as one that gets really heavily affected by you know, high water levels, as well as, you know, wind flows that blow water from, you know, east to west and East Harbor. And we seem like we had a bunch of storms like that in, in 2019 that really made it difficult for people to enjoy beach recreation on East Harbor. Well, our data shows that, you know, 2018, we recorded or estimated 152,000 visitors between July 8th and September 1 on East Harbor. That was down to 63,000 in 2019, largely because the beach kind of disappeared there. It wasn't much of a beach at all, actually, that season. So we see that high water levels can have a big impact and they actually reduce visits on those Western uh, basin beaches by about 38%, so a significant impact. Now, not every one of them went down. Uh, so you can see some substitution that is probably because, you know, say Old Wilma's Creek kind of went up because it probably wasn't as heavily, it's a little more elevated from the, the lake and may have not have been as heavily affected by, um, you know, by the, the high water levels. Okay, so the more important thing that we looked at was trying to value amenity losses from harmful algal blooms and bacterial war warnings. So in 2019, uh, the, the year we surveyed all 28 beaches, uh, there were five harmful algal bloom warnings during that season and 110 bacterial warnings on the beaches that we looked at. So one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to value these, these effects. Um, so here's how we did it. Uh, we did it with two approaches. The, the first approach is we had data on actual visitation. So we know what beaches people were going to. Uh, this was as a result of actually going out to the beaches and counting visitors and then intercepting them. So we use a statistical uh, uh, procedure to figure out the value of sort of the baseline set of trips people were taking. Then the question is, is how do you value the change that might happen with these harmful algal blooms or bacterial warnings? And what we did with that is we used our survey. We had that additional online survey. It was a follow-up survey that happened after we intercepted these individuals on the beach. And what we do is what's called a choice experiment. So we asked these individuals to tell us something about what beaches they would most prefer given a set of characteristics for those beaches. So here on the left, you can kind of see a scenario that we would present to people. Now remember, these are people who actually go to beaches. So they understand these characteristics. They're, they're individuals who've already selected themselves as beachgoers. So they understand something about sand quality on Lake Erie beaches. They know something about algal blooms because they've probably seen the signs or maybe even experienced them. Same thing with bacterial advisories. Know something about water clarity differences across beaches, crowding, and obviously they know how far they went. So, so we use these choice experiments to understand how people would respond and sort of make their own choices about what kinds of beaches they would prefer to go to. Uh, so one thing we can do with this is we can actually ask and figure out which one is worse. So we detected that, in fact, actually, both of them are just as bad. So if you look at this, this is kind of an interesting graph. You can see this uh, over here at the zero, that people are willing to drive 260 miles or so further to get away from a harmful algal bloom or a, a E. coli uh, bacterial uh, sort of closure on a beach. So this is a significant thing. People are willing to drive a lot further to get rid of these things. Now you're probably scratching your head and saying, well, that's crazy. I mean, no one's going to drive 260 miles to get away from one of these things. And yeah, that's true. This is what they're saying. But you know, on the other hand, all of us, I can guarantee that all of us are going to pay $6 a gallon for gasoline if we have to, right? So remember, willingness to pay is not what somebody actually pays. So this is representing a significant and strong uh, reaction by individuals that they really do not want these things, that they will do a lot to avoid having or being having to experience either a harmful algal bloom or an E. coli uh, bacterial uh, problem on a beach. Uh, you can see now the other thing we did is we asked people to sort of respond to sort of the days since the water quality event. So, we, so one of the 
sort of choices was, is, you know, would you go to this beach if the bacterial exposure had happened three days ago or one day ago or six days ago, or it had been uh, cleaned up or had gone away and was now, the beach was nice for a day. Would you now go to it or nice for three days? Would you go to it? And what we found is, is that there's some residual negative influence of these bacterial warnings and harmful algal blooms several days up to six days after, uh, after they've happened, right? And so, you know, we know that, and one of the questions people might ask, what's the policy relevance of this is that, well, if we have information and we're trying to tell people when these harmful algal blooms or when these bacterial closures have, have resolved themselves, when the, the problem has gone away and the beach is reopened again, you know, one of the issues is, is why people don't show up right away. Well, they don't show up right away, maybe because the information hasn't gotten out there, but they're also not showing up because there's a taint that they're just not going there because they, you know, they're just not ready to go back to that beach. So this data is suggesting that there's still a damage that's happening even after these things have been closed up. And when we quantify the total impact of these things in the 2019 season, the impact on visitors was $4 million. 26% of that is attributable to these harmful algal blooms, 74%. So most of the effects in 2019 were bacterial effects. The, the algal bloom, you know, if you look at the data from the maps and everything like that, the, the algal bloom was really bad in 2019, at least the, the sort of map data shows us that, but the actual effects on beaches were actually small relative to other years. It's a pretty small year for that, much bigger for E. coli problems, but it's still 15% of the value. So the, the value would have been 15% bigger if they hadn't have happened. The impact on visitors and economic contribution was a loss of 221,000 trips. So there's a big impact there and about 22 million in local contribution. So, you know, we can use this data to show that there is a real tangible economic impact of E. coli and harmful algal blooms on, on not just the people who visit the beach, but also the economic activity. So in conclusion, you know, public beaches are a really important amenity. They provide around $25 million per year in recreational value. They contribute about $148 million per year in economic value to local businesses. So they have a huge effect, not just for the individuals who take the trips and enjoy the beaches, but also for the local businesses that provide support for you know, not just beachgoers, but obviously a lot of other stuff, but they're an important part of the business for many businesses out there. They re the harmful algal blooms and bacteria reduced this value by about 15% in 2019. Uh, we're currently doing analysis to sort of go back to 2011 and, and use these data to try to figure out what the effects would have been over that sort of 2011 to 2020 period. Uh, so we'll hopefully have that done soon, uh, but we don't have it available today. But nonetheless, this tells a pretty interesting story, we think. And I want to say a special thanks to these individuals who really made this, this uh, possible. As I talked about those enumerators who went out to the beaches, I mean, we had a fantastic group of enumerators over two summers who went out to beaches and collected this data for us. I can't thank them enough. I mean, they, they just did an incredible job. I mean, you think about how hard that would be to go out and bother somebody who's enjoying their day on the beach. And that's what, just exactly what these guys did. They were not counted. And then they stopped people and talked to them. And, you know, there's a few cases we heard of of people not responding so well to that, but by and large, 95, 99% of the time, people really responded well to them. So thanks to these individuals listed there for their help on this. So I'll stop there and open it up to questions. Jill, do you want me to stop the share on this or maybe I should keep it there in case people ask something that I can flip to on the slides? Uh, you can keep it there. Um, we had quite a few people asking for it, and I think it was like one of your earlier slides with a lot of the, the data. Um, they were asking some questions, um, and I'll, let me just kind of go through those. Um, one of the first questions that, um, we want that they were asking for some clarification was when you went when the when you were collecting this data what was the what was the time frame in the year what was it summer was it early spring through summer yeah you know for the for the um okay yeah for the for the 2019 season we actually did the the, the beach season basically from memorial day to labor day um so that was that was 2019 and 2018 it was a little shorter time period because um, we were just getting the survey started testing out our methods and so it was a shorter time period actually just uh, June 1 to really September 8th I think. Okay um, could you talk a little bit about um, did you um, did you estimate annual visits from only counting on one day? 
No, you know, this is amazing. We were out at those beaches a minimum of two times a week at a randomly selected time. So we were at every beach two times a week at a randomly selected time. And so this was in a pretty intensive. So we had um, in, in 2019, we had four numerators on the west, Western Basin, four on the Eastern Basin. And they, they basically, you know, went to every day of the week, we're at uh, three beaches a day, basically um, collecting this data. And so it's pretty intensive coverage across. So we feel pretty, pretty comfortable that the, and by the way, I mean, the strategy and this approach is, is widely used um, by you know public policy people to do the same kinds of analysis at different kinds of public spaces to figure out uh, visitation. It's getting easier today because people are using cell phone data. We've been trying to test out some of that now, but um, but nonetheless, this is a pretty good approach for actually figuring out visitation when you don't have um, you know you can't have someone there counting every single day, every moment. Um, how do you um, how do you how is value determined? Uh, for visitors? So the value for visitors themselves, we're basically estimating in economics what we call a demand function. So what we know is, is that people, um, they, they have to spend money both driving to, driving to a site. So they're spending gasoline money as well as car time doing that. Uh, and they're also the most important value on that is their opportunity cost of time. So it's that they, they're spending time getting to that beach. Uh, and they'll spend more opportunity cost of time, they'll spend more time getting to a beach, driving further if it has better amenities. So we kind of take advantage of that. We're able to actually estimate a demand function. And you can see pretty clearly in the data that the number of trips people take uh, is directly correlated to the distance the beach is from them. Uh, so they'll go to they'll go to really nice, I mean, they'll go to you know, East Harbor or one of the really nice beaches. Uh, They'll go there if even though it's a long ways away because it's nicer. And then they'll go, you know, maybe once once a month they'll go to that more distant one. But you know, the other ten times that month they go to a beach, they go to a local one just because they don't have as much time. So we can we can detect a lot from that visitation information once we figure out where they're going and what they're doing. Okay. Um, was there any uh, correlation between weather and the survey visits? Did you guys look at that at all? We have, yeah, there's a very close correlation. And so we've we've done some work on that. I haven't I haven't actually uh, sort of tried to analyze that any further, but we definitely can see you know weather patterns and their influence. And, I mean, for sure we see it in the numbers data um, when we count when we do the counts, right? Because because one of the things we have from the data we collected is the count of people who are on each beach exactly at the moment we went there. And we also know the weather at the moment that they went there because the enumerators recorded the weather at that time as well. So so we do have uh, good information on that. We, you know, we can see just exactly what people expect, rainy, cruddy days. There's either no one or just one or two people walking a dog or something like that on the beach, right? And the, the rest of the time when it's a nice hot day, you know, it's just filled up with people, right? So we can definitely see that and you kind of get what you expect. Okay. Um, another question we had was, um, was the hab effect only 15 percent because that was how often habs impacted the beach so if habs had impacted the beach more often than bacteria then its share of economic impact would be greater so should we take that 15 percent as an estimate only for one year and be careful how we use it yeah yeah so it's it's uh, not exactly linear. So there's one thing I didn't show is that, so our methods allow us to calculate a separate per visitor beach value for each beach. So, you know, the nicer beaches uh, are going to have higher dollar values per, um, per person, right? So, and these harmful algal blooms are going to affect differentially each beach. So it's not exactly linear. So it wouldn't be that, you know, if, if, if it's not that you know the the harmful algal blooms affected uh, beach visitation days by fifteen percent, so it's a fifteen percent effect. That's not actually how we did that calculation. Um, there's two components to that. One is is that it's where the harmful algal bloom, it's which beaches where the harmful algal bloom happened and which beaches it affected. You know that dollar per visit number may be bigger or smaller depending on that beach. Does that make sense? I mean, we're, you know, so it's, we're sort of using all that information um, and it's not a direct linear effect just on the number of days. Um, so, 
yeah, to, to extrapolate it to another year, I would say a first approximation, you could probably go ahead and use a linear thing if it, you know, something like that would be a bad approximation. Um, however, you know, I would always say that, you know, it'd be better to try to go back and say which beaches specifically did the harmful algal bloom affect? What was the dollar per day value for that place? And then how many visits did it affect? And remember, there's another part of this, which is important, is that harmful algal blooms and E. coli uh, warnings don't actually close or keep people from walking on the beach. And there's still value in these beaches, right? So yeah, you know, that's another part that we're able to actually calculate with this data is, is we know that there are people out there on the beaches even though they don't go in the water and that they're not as much affected. I mean, they're, they are affected by harmful algal blooms. I mean, no one likes to look at the green water and, and to see the, the effects of that or even to know that this is happening while they're there. But, um, but that, you know, we're also trying to account for that in our data. So I don't know, that's kind of a, a long answer to a, a good question, but it's not exactly linear. Okay. Um... Could you talk about, so we got, a, we got a couple of questions from people asking about if this um, data can be used in other places. So here's one question. Uh, has this research been used as reference material to leverage support for more Lake Erie protections? Will the methods you use to determine the value of Lake Erie beaches to the economy of Ohio be transferable to Great Lakes states like New York and possibly transferable to ocean beaches? Sorry, that was a long question. That's all good. I mean, you know, the, in terms of could it be used for policy, and I think it should be used for policy. I think it can help actually make some policy decisions, especially about keeping uh, public spaces available for the public in places like the Lake Erie shoreline. I mean, if anything, this should show that, I mean, this is really valuable stuff. Uh, it's valuable to the individuals, but it's also valuable to the economy and to the people who aren't actually on the beach because it's supporting significant economic activity. So, you know, to me, arguments that, oh, we should take the beaches and either privatize them or turn them into houses uh, is a bad idea because these actually probably are providing as much, if not more value on a per acre basis. It doesn't mean we should take every place and turn it into a beach, but it does mean that these ones are really important. And if, there's, if there are opportunities in some communities up there to create more public space, it looks like a really worthwhile activity. So I think that comes out of this analysis. Um, in terms of can they be transferred to other places, I mean, for sure, uh, these, you know, probably would really well transfer to other places like uh, Pennsylvania and, and New York along the Lake Erie shoreline. Um, maybe also to, you know, Ontario uh, and even over on the Canada, the Canadian side, right? There is some research in, in uh, Michigan. So there's, you know, Frank Loopy has done plenty of research on beaches in Michigan. So we have data there. You don't have to transfer analysis there. Um, but yeah, they could be, you know, in terms of transferring to the to the big oceans, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a, a different context there. The estimates I've seen from because we do have so Frank and others participated in a lot of research on uh, what happened to beaches after the um, Deepwater Horizon accident in the Gulf of Mexico about a decade or so ago, and they found uh, bigger per day values uh, for those beaches. Not surprisingly, because they're ocean beaches and they get a lot of visitors from really far distances away. I mean, not that Lake Erie doesn't have people coming from far away, but it's just not as much as say that, you know, the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico beaches. So I don't know that it transfers so well to those other locations like that, um, but certainly within the Great Lakes and within uh, Lake Erie, I think, and potentially Ontario, I think it can help be helpful. Okay. Um, what would you say is the, what would be the best ways uh, beach managers can take advantage or use this data? You know, I mean, some of that's on us. I think I think we, we need to do a better job of creating um, the data or putting together the data in, in report like function that, that produces it on a per beach basis. So I think that's I think we should do that. Um, and that would be helpful. I mean, I'm always happy to provide it to people. Um, and you feel free to email me if you want sort of information on your particular beach. Um, we can do that, put that together for you. Uh, it's it'd be just probably it's really we should probably just do that for every beach uh, and either put it online or create something some sort of a fact sheet or something like that that has that I mean we do have one publication out it's on a, a different part of the, of the research I should have put that citation in here uh, Greg Boudreau is the lead author on it we'll have another one out on these results from this thing hopefully in the next six months or so 
Um, but you know, it's kind of on us to get that out. It's available. I'm having just email me if you want any more detailed information. I'm happy to actually provide that. And we can, if, um, because a couple of people had asked whether or not there were, if they could see the survey results as well as um, other um, like journal articles or anything. And we can put that on the web page later on if you want to provide that. And we can send that off to folks too. Perfect. Uh, Okay, so I did get um, a question from, I actually got a couple of questions from the um, the North Olmsted fifth grade class. So let me get that question for you. So this is a question from Pine Intermediate School. And they were asking um, how long you've been studying uh, this type of Lake Erie research. Um, and are there others within Ohio State and uh, other universities that are doing the same kind of research? Yeah, no, great question. Thanks for that. Um, you know, this is, well, Jill, as you know, I mean, 2020, gosh, that's 20 years ago. 1998. I, I yeah, 1998. so 24 years ago. <laughs> we did a, we started out on this with, uh, you know, the C, C Grant agents were, up there on Lake Erie, Mary Beale and Frank Blickcoppler were saying, you know, beaches are really important and no one's ever studied them. And, and I remember thinking, ah, oh, that's not true. People have studied beaches. They've been around forever, obviously. But <laughs> it turns out that no one had actually studied Lake Erie Beach or any beach in the Great Lakes region, uh, at least to figure out what its economic value was. So, so yeah, the Sea Grant supported that research uh, and we did that. Um, some slightly different approach to the analysis, but we did um, similar kind of analysis and, and um, you know, came up with some interesting results and had had those uh, those were there and they they you know really were the only ones. Now more people have done it since then uh, in different parts of the Great Lakes, but um, there still is a, a a paucity of this information. So so I've been doing this on the Lake Erie beaches for a long time. Um, although there was a lot of years we didn't do anything, so <laughs> I think that was a shame. Yeah, you know, I think the state needs to do that. I think you know, I think the fifth grade class needs to keep asking the state to provide information like this, that, that's useful for us to know something about who does what with our public spaces, right? And, and so I think, you know, continuing this kind of work on a more regular basis is kind of a good idea, just so we know what people are doing on these public spaces. Um, so that's, and there are a lot of other people. So in my own department, we have four or five of us who are really interested in environmental economics and and trying to use, uh, you know, economics to help, you know, make the case for either better protection or different kinds of policies that can, can help, you know, improve environmental outcomes or make, make the way we go about business a little more sustainable. So there's a, it's a growing area and there's a lot more people doing it. All right. Um, all right, I've got a couple more questions and we actually have gotten quite a few questions. And so I'm gonna to get to as many as we can. And Dr. Sanjan has said that he will answer what questions we don't get to. We'll post his answers on the website later on. So uh, your questions will be answered here. Um, let me see. Uh, a question we got was, is it possible to compare beach frontage value with beaches in other geographic areas? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. There's no reason not to really. I mean, you really just have to have the same um, basis. So, you know, for instance, we have this, what we call the economic value to the visitor themselves. That's a consumer surplus number. So as long as another person has estimated that same thing, one can compare those two things. And presumably, the, the you know, one would expect two things when you see higher values. So if you look back at those numbers, um, and I don't know, you can see if this comports to your own sort of thought process. Um, you know, the 348 for East Harbor, uh, Nickel Plate, you know, that's a really nice beach, but it's not that big, right? And there's a private section of beach that's right next to it, right? So there's, so it's a public space in an area where there's a lot of population and a lot of population that actually wants to visit beaches. So it's a kind of a a scarce resource. Same thing with Edgewater, right downtown Cleveland, right? You've got a lot of population there, a bit of a scarce resource, and, and a lot of people visiting there for all kinds of reasons, downtown Cleveland. So, you know, you can start to see these numbers make some sense from an economics perspective, um, you know, that, they, that they're higher where there's more scarcity and where there's more people. 
uh, especially people who want to visit, uh, who might be interested and be there specifically to visit uh, the shoreline. So, you know, Port Clinton, why is that a little bit lower? I mean, my guess on that one is, is people aren't there for, for visiting the shoreline in Port Clinton, they're there for fishing. So they're not going to spend a lot of time on the beach for, you know, I would guess that if we looked at fishing values at, at Nickel Plate versus Port Clinton, we'd find the Port Clinton fishing values are significantly higher, right? So I don't know, that's just my guess here. So I think these numbers can be compared across places. All right, um, let me ask two more questions. Um, we have asked, I have um, heard from a couple of people asking if there is a possibility of, of getting the thesis or the, uh, I guess I think it was the thesis of the student. So Correct. we'll try to get all that gathered up. A lot of people are really interested in the results of your next step. And I guess here's one of the questions is what is after you're doing the uh, 2020 data, what would be the next step that you would want to do in this research? Well, you know, we, we'd like to sort of redo this on more than an every 20 year basis. I don't know that you need it every year, but every five to 10 years, I think it's a good repeat to sort of make sure you're keeping up with these values. I mean, these are significantly higher than what they were 20 some years ago, which is interesting. And I think visitation is actually down if we look at our estimates. So it means that people are putting more value on things that they're doing less. Um, so they're you know, they're constrained in time. They got a lot of other things to do out there. And so they, they really value these trips. So to me, that says, gosh, let's make these spaces as nice as we can for them so that when they take those trips, they get as much value out of them as they can. And I guarantee you there's a correlation. Well, you can see it right here. There's a correlation between the value people put on these spaces and the value society and other economic activity gets out of it, right? So these economic cont contributions are really big in places because you have nice beaches there. So, you know, giving value to the individuals who take the beach trips is important. Making those spaces as nice as you can will help do that. And that then leads to economic contribution. Uh, so, you know, our next steps are to, you know, try to get this done again in a couple of years, but also, um, you know, we're interested in trying to make sure that other, that as much public space is valued as we can do within the state of Ohio. So we're trying to do this across different resources throughout the state. Um, and, you know, so you think of, I think we might have lost Dr. Sanjan. Christina, are you getting a delay on Dr. Sanjan? I am, yes. I okay. think something is frozen. I think he is frozen. But so I guess what we will do is um, we um, we have gotten a lot of other great questions and Dr. Sanjan is planning on answering those questions. So we'll get that to him and get those posted on the website and we'll let you know when those are available because there are really a lot of great questions. So we really appreciate that. Um, so I'll, let me just wrap up here. Um, I wanted to thank, well, Dr. Sanjan um, for his willingness to talk to us today about his beach research. It was really an excellent discussion, great questions. Also, I wanted to thank uh, Christina Dierkes for her work organizing this webinar series this year. Very gracious about that. Uh, I did want to remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. So please take a few minutes to fill that out. This webinar uh, series is sponsored by a house Sea Grant and will be continuing next month with Dr. Mark McCarthy, who will be discussing his harmful algal bloom research in Grand Lake St. Mary's. The registration link is in the chat. So thank you again to Dr. Sanjan and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon.